welcome to all distinguished guests. Once again, I want to add my or extend my uh, welcome to the many, many people who have traveled from, uh, from distant places to be with us uh, here this morning, especially to the midshipmen uh, who are joining us here today. Uh, I think uh, I speak for everyone here that this is a truly unique experience, and uh, I feel incredibly privileged uh, to be up here on the panel with these three gentlemen. Now, Captain Huey mentioned that we both work in the Leadership Education and Development Division, and uh, the study of leadership is, is our calling. It's an avocation as well as, vo as a vocation. But before the study of leadership existed as a standalone field, there were biographers and historians such as Plutarch, uh, Einhard, Tom Thomas Carlyle, uh, before behavioral scientists added to, uh, although some might uh, claim diluted, the analysis of leadership as a component of human discourse, there was a prevailing idea that heroism was the culmination of human potential. Thomas Carlyle himself said that heroism is the divine relation which in all times unites great men to others. And General J.F.C. Fuller believed that heroism, whether in peace or war, is the sheet anchor of a people. Now, as psychologists and sociologists have dissected acts of heroism, we've uh, become accustomed to the treatment of heroes and the heroic, not as the culmination of human potential, but as a peculiar phenomenon, a curious behavioral anomaly. Now, this conference, therefore, is really a return to a, an earlier view of heroes and the heroic. Rather than treat our heroes as an anomaly, the underlying foundation of this gathering will be to treat them as that which we all aspire to be, the very embodiment of the qualities of selfless courage, moral conviction, and shining example. Heroes will be treated as they were traditionally, as exemplars of all we could be. So with that as an opener, I propose we do uh, this morning three things as an opener to this panel. Uh, I'm going to present three artifacts, three pieces of evidence that uh, I think will put us all uh, in, a, in a mindset to look at heroism and acts uh, such as these uh, as a traditional view of the culmination of human potential. Uh, these are three distinct acts from three separate wars, decades separating them, and three unique individuals, all who uh, distinguish themselves in these acts. But all three, I think we'll find, are connected with what they represent for the rest of us. A culmination of human potential. Exemplars for the rest of us, what we aspire to be. So, these three artifacts now, these three pieces of evidence for us. Beginning uh, to my immediate right, Corporal Herschel W. Woody Williams, United States Marine Corps Reserve, for services set forth in the following citation. For conspicuous gallantry and intrepidity, at the risk of his life above and beyond the call of duty as demolition sergeant serving with the 1st Battalion, 21st Marines, 3rd Marine Division, in action against enemy Japanese forces on Iwo Jima, Volcano Island, 23 February 1945. Quick to volunteer his services when our tanks were maneuvering vainly to open a lane for the infantry through a network of reinforced concrete pillboxes, buried mines, and black volcanic sands, Corporal Williams daringly went forward alone to attempt the reduction of devastating machine gun fire from the unyielding positions. Covered only by four riflemen, he fought desperately for four hours under terrific enemy small arms fire and repeatedly returned to his own lines to prepare demolition charges and obtain serviced flamethrowers, struggling back frequently to the rear of hostile emplacements to wipe out one position after another. On one occasion, he daringly mounted a pillbox to insert the nozzle of his flamethrower through the air vent, kill the occupants, and silence the gun. On another, he grimly charged an enemy rifleman who attempted to stop him with bayonets and destroyed them with a burst of flame from his weapon. His unyielding determination and extraordinary heroism in the face of ruthless enemy resistance were directly instrumental in neutralizing one of the most fanatically defended Japanese strong points encountered by this regiment and aided in enabling his company to reach its objective. Corporal Williams' aggressive fighting spirit and valiant devotion to duty throughout this fiercely contested action sustain and enhance the highest traditions of the United States Naval Service. Ladies and gentlemen, Corporal Woody Williams. Thank you. Thank you.
In the center of the panel today, Lieutenant Thomas Norris, U.S. Navy SEAL Advisor, Strategic Technical Director at Assistance Team, Headquarters, U.S. Military Assistance Command, Vietnam. For conspicuous gallantry and intrepidity in action at the risk of his life above and beyond the call of duty, while serving as a SEAL Advisor with, with the Strategic Technical Director at Assistance Team, Headquarters, U.S. Military Assistance Command, Vietnam. During the period 10 to 13 April 1972, Lieutenant Norris completed an unprecedented ground rescue of two downed pilots deep within heavily controlled enemy territory in Quang Tri Province. Lieutenant Norris, on the night of 10 April, led a five-man patrol through 2,000 meters of heavily controlled enemy territory, located one of the downed pilots at daybreak, and returned to the forward operating base, or FOB. On 11 April, after a devastating mortar and rocket attack on the small FOB, Lieutenant Norris led a three-man team on two unsuccessful rescue attempts for the second pilot. On the afternoon of the 12th, a forward air controller located the pilot and notified Lieutenant Norris. Dressed in fisherman disguises and using a sampan, Lieutenant Norris and one Vietnamese traveled throughout the night and found the injured pilot at dawn. Covering the pilot with bamboo and vegetation, they began the return journey successfully evading a North Vietnamese patrol. Approaching the FOB, they came under heavy machine gun fire. Lieutenant Norris called in an airstrike which provided suppression fire and a smoke screen, allowing the rescue party to reach the FOB. By his outstanding display of decisive leadership, undaunted courage, and selfless dedication in the face of extreme danger, Lieutenant Norris enhanced the finest traditions of the United States Naval Service. Ladies and gentlemen, Lieutenant Tommy Norris. Finally, Staff Sergeant Clinton L. Romache. Staff Sergeant Clinton L. Romache distinguished himself by acts of gallantry and intrepidity at the risk of his life above and beyond the call of duty while serving as section leader with Bravo Troop, 3rd Squadron, 61st Cavalry Regiment, 4th Brigade Combat Team, 4th Infantry Division during combat operations against an armed enemy at Combat Outpost Keating, Kamdesh District, Nuristan Province, Afghanistan on October 3rd, 2009. On that morning, Staff Sergeant Romache and his comrades awakened to an attack by an estimated 300 fighters occupying the high ground on all four sides of the complex, employing concentrated fire from recoilless rifles, rocket-propelled grenades, anti-aircraft machine guns, mortars, and small arms fire. Staff Sergeant Romache moved uncovered under intense enemy fire to conduct a reconnaissance of the battlefield and seek reinforcements from the barracks before returning to action with the support of an assistant gunner. Staff Sergeant Romache took out an enemy machine gun team, and while engaging a second, the generator he was using for cover was struck by a rocket-propelled grenade, inflicting him with grievous shrapnel wounds. Undeterred by his injuries, Staff Sergeant Romache continued to fight, and upon the arrival of another soldier to aid him and the assistant gunner, he again rushed through the exposed avenue to assemble additional soldiers. Staff Sergeant Romache then mobilized a five-man team and returned to the fight equipped with a sniper rifle. With complete disregard for his own safety, Staff Sergeant Romache continually exposed himself to heavy enemy fire as he moved confidently about the battlefield, engaging and destroying multiple enemy targets, including three Taliban fighters who had breached the combat outpost perimeter. While orchestrating a successful plan to secure and reinforce key points of the battlefield, Staff Sergeant Romache maintained radio communication with the Tactical Operations Center as the enemy forces attacked with even greater ferocity, unleashing a barrage of rocket-propelled grenades and recoilless rifle rounds. Staff Sergeant Romache identified the point of attack and directed air support to destroy over 30 enemy fighters. After receiving reports that seriously injured soldiers were at a distant battle position, Staff Sergeant Romache and his team provided covering fire to allow the injured soldiers to safely reach the aid station. Upon receipt of orders to proceed to the next objective, his teams pushed forward 100 meters under overwhelming fire to recover and prevent the enemy fighters from taking the bodies of their fa fallen comrades. Staff Sergeant Romache's heroic actions throughout the day-long battle were critical in suppressing an enemy that had far greater numbers. His extraordinary efforts gave Bravo Troop the opportunity to regroup, reorganize, and prepare for the counterattack that allowed the troop to account for its personnel and secure out combat outpost Keating. Staff Sergeant Romache's discipline and extraordinary heroism above and beyond the call of duty reflect great credit upon himself, Bravo Troop, 3rd Squadron, 61st Cavalry Regiment, 4th Brigade Combat Team, 4th Infantry Division, and the United States Army. Ladies and gentlemen, Staff Sergeant Clint Romache.
Gentlemen, I want to thank you for your patience for that, but I think it's important to get everybody here on the same sheet of music, as they say, to understand uh, where we'll go with this conversation. Now, I had a friend a few years ago. He's a, a former A6 pilot in the Marine Corps, turned psychologist. Uh, he's been teaching at North Dakota State University, actually, for a number of years, uh, who has written extensively, researched extensively, the uh, concept of extreme bravery, valor, in combat. His name's Terry Barrett. And in one particular work, not coincidentally using Congressional Medal of Honor recipients as case studies, he tried to draw some themes in the preparation of these incredible human beings and the lessons they may have or hold for the rest of us. So it's with that as backdrop, uh, Dr. Barrett's work as backdrop, our first question for the panel. The first question we have is, can you provide us with some background about your youth, upbringing, reasons for serving uh, that can help us understand uh, you a little bit better? Sir? Do I get the privilege of going first? Yes, sir, you did. <laughs> Good morning. Well, before I answer his question, let me clear up a couple of things. I do possess the Medal of Honor. It's in my other suit. <laughs> I was at a function this past weekend. Just like a Marine. Just like a Marine. <laughs> and, and we can't depend on the Navy to help us when we need help. Ouch. Ouch. <laughs> anyway, I was <laughs> at a function this past weekend, and, and I had my medal in my coat pocket, and I changed suits, and it's, it's home. I want to also say that I am rather privileged to be a Cherry, Cherry, C-H-E-R-R-Y, Cherry River Admiral. In West Virginia, we have a Cherry River Admiral Association. We have 36 admirals in that association. And I happen to be one of them. <clears throat> I think circumstances have a great deal on what happens to us. I'm an American because I was born in America. I'm a West Virginian because I was born in West Virginia. I was in war because somebody told me somebody was trying to take my freedom. Growing up in the country on a dairy farm with no military influence in our community at all, seldom ever saw a person in uniform. But we had a couple individuals in the community who didn't like to hoe corn and dig potatoes and pitch hay and shovel cow residue. <laughs> I cleaned that up for you. <laughs> so they decided to go into the Marine Corps. They were not related. They went in at different times. But they went in the Marine Corps to make a living because jobs were very difficult to obtain during the Depression. Their enlistment period was six years. That was the only contract the Marine Corps had at that time. When they came home on their one time a year 30-day furlough, they were required to wear their Marine Corps dress blues. I'm in my early teens, and we kids would get around them, and we wanted to be around them because they would tell us fantastic stories about battles and all that stuff that probably most of it wasn't true. But it was entertaining and interesting to us. And they had to wear their dress blues all the time. That was the only uniform they brought home with them. So somewhere in the recesses of my mind, I must have decided if 
I ever have to go to the military, and I had no plan for that at all. I'm going to be a farmer the rest of my life. I'm going to be milking cows the rest of my life. But somewhere in the recess of my mind, I said, if I ever have to go or do go, I want to be one of them. They became a role model to me. So when we were told in our community, we had no newspaper, very few people had a radio. I had one uncle that, out of five that had a radio. So the information we got was filtered into us by other people. We're talking about after Pearl Harbor. We're talking about 1942. That somebody is trying to take our freedom. I had never heard of the Japanese. Certainly had never seen one. But I decided that's not going to happen to me or to us. I had a school teacher who taught us very severely that we were Americans, we were free, but we were only that because of what others had done for us. Somebody had provided that freedom for us. So I'm going into the Marine Corps to protect America. My concept was that all of us going in from all over wherever they were, and I had hardly ever been out of West Virginia, that we would all gather in, West, in the United States of America and just dare anybody to come to our shores and try to take our country and our freedom. When I finished boot camp in San Diego, California, and they told me I was going to the South Pacific, which I had never even heard tell of, it was quite a shock. Because I thought I would stay right here. Just, we're not going to take my freedom. That was my upbringing. And my teacher is the one, not my parents. My teacher was the one that instilled in me my love for my country. And that freedom was one of the most precious possessions we could ever have. Never dreaming as I was going through the grades that we would ever be in war. Remember, World War I was supposed to be the war to end all wars. So most of us never thought there would be another. I was in the Marine Corps because of circumstances. I'm proud of my service. I'm proud that I am an American. And I'm proud that I could do what I did to keep us a free people. Thank you very much. I guess it's my turn now. I'll try and be a little bit shorter than Woody. Um, where I grew up, I grew up um, at the end of World War II. My father was in the Navy. He served in World War II. He taught me the values that uh, I grew up with and I lived by. And he taught me respect and uh, the love of this country and what it, what it stands for. Uh, though as I was a child, we were no longer engaged in a conflict situation um, until Korea started. I can remember as a young child in school, uh, we'd do air raid uh, drills, which meant every time a siren went off, we crowded under our desk. What good that was going to do, I don't know, but I guess they figured that's the way you uh, defend yourself. Um, but we really didn't have much uh, um, concern about a conflict. Korea went, uh, started happening when I was in junior high school, and um, I had actually pretty much uh, had ended by then. I had some teachers that served in, in Korea who were also um, 
instilled in us a, a, a great respect for the freedoms that we have. Um, and I had always intended to serve this country. I was brought up to believe that uh, um, we should at least give back uh, some time to our country for everything that it's given us. And I did intend to serve. Um, as I went on in, in uh, schooling, of course the Vietnam War happened. Vietnam conflict, excuse me, never was a war. Um, you can't quite understand that either, but um, we knew at that time that we were probably going to have to serve. It was a draft type situation back then. There were a lot of volunteers as well, certainly. But uh, draft boards um, pretty much controlled um, who was going into the service. And as long as you were a student, you were pretty much exempt. When you got you had graduated from college, that exemption ended, depending on the board. Uh, so I knew that I was going to go in, and I intended to serve. Uh, uh, I wanted to go into the Navy. I wanted to fly airplanes. Um, so I, I enlisted, and uh, um, the, uh, uh, my experience in the service had been uh, probably one of the most rewarding uh, opportunities that I ever had, and I was truly uh, appreciative to be able to help serve in some way. Um, but uh, the things that helped form those opinions were um, some of the, the um, backgrounds that I got through my, not, not only through my family, but through the various people that I met uh, as I was growing up. So I wasn't uh, quite in the same class as, as, as Woody was. World War II was probably the the war that kept us from speaking another language. Uh, the conflicts I was involved in were more or less sustaining actions to try and keep other countries from being overrun uh, or, or, or uh, keeping them from becoming de democratic type countries. So, um, but I fully intended to serve and, and I went in, um, uh, actually I volunteered and went in um, after my college uh, education. And I was proud, and, and still am proud, to be a uh, uh, person who served for the great country that we live in. Thank you. So there's that. Um, growing up, I, I grew up in Northern California, where I was born and raised. Um, and I had a history of family service. My grandfather was World War II, uh, was on the beaches of Normandy. Uh, Battle of the Bulge. My father served in Vietnam. Both my older brothers uh, served in the military. So from an early age, I knew it wasn't a prerequisite to be uh, a member of my family uh, to serve, but I always felt like it was something I was going to do. Um, it just felt natural. Uh, listening to my grandfather talk and my father talk and my brothers talk, you know, was was such pride. <laughs> Uh, of their, their comrades they served with, with their, their battle buddies. Um, and growing up in this Northern California town, it wasn't very big, and I like to brag, I'll use this opportunity to brag that there at the Naval Academy, I got to graduate and the top 14 of my high school class, uh, the 15 kids that went there. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, and like Woody, uh, I didn't want to milk cows anymore or stack hay, uh, so I joined one as a a sense of, you know, family honor, uh, to, to, to get away, to, to expand my horizons, to travel the world, to go see other things. Um, and I barely, very quickly realized that I joined for one thing, but I ended up serving for another. And that was for, you know, my, my battle buddies to my left and right. That was for, as soon as I joined the military, it was 1999, we didn't have a whole lot of stuff going on back then. Um, but my first duty station was Germany. And within the first week of after uh, arriving there in Germany, I got shipped off because my unit was already deployed to Kosovo. And I got to see firsthand what a country looked like with no freedom. A country that we had to do military escorts for them to go get groceries and, uh, and fuel so they wouldn't get captured and killed in mass genocide stuff that I took for granted as a punk 17, 18 year old kid, S stuff that simple that I'd seen around the world isn't given freely, isn't available to everyone. 
Um, and that's why I actually ended up serving. I was going to do three years, get my family stamp, call it a day, figure out what I was going to do with the rest of my life and, and continue, continue on. And shortly three years turned into six, six turned into nine, and nine turned into almost 12 before I finally uh, got out of the military. Um, you know, it's the, the sense of pride and the sense of honor to, to understand that the sacrifice set before me with these great gentlemen here, with all those that have served, it was the least I could do to pay back this gift that was given to me at no cost just for being born in this country. Um, and I'm so appreciative of it. And that's what ultimately motivated me to not just join, but to actually serve. Well, there certainly is a common thread of, of heroism in the citations that we heard uh, at the front end, and there are certain themes, threads as well, from the, from the commentary. But we've got three separate wars, as mentioned, um, separated by decades, and in fact, three separate services. If, if you would mind, take a moment to reflect on your military training and the experiences you had before going into combat and how that prepared you. Uh, in, in my day of growing up, and there's some in here that can fit this picture too, uh, discipline in the home existed. My father died when I was nine, so I was raised by brothers. I was the last of the litter, so I was the runt. And I was raised by brothers. And when I was told something, as were they, to do something, you were expected to do it. You just said, yes, sir, and or, yes, and went ahead and did it. And you did it to the very best that you could. When I went into the Marine Corps, discipline was not a problem for me because I had lived under that kind of discipline at home. So that wasn't a problem. But the thing that I learned in the Marine Corps was that the other guy, the other guy beside you on your right and left, is also going to be responsible for you, and you are going to be responsible for them. I had never had that before. I had never understood, even with brothers, if a brother got into a fight, it was up to him to win his own fight. I'm not going to help him. If he gets beat up, he gets beat up. And that's the way we lived. So that was a complete change to me, that I had to be responsible for that guy on my right and left. But that, in the long run, is really what saved me. In my citation, had I written that, it would have been a newspaper long. <laughs> they didn't ask me any questions. They didn't ask me to write my own citation. I'm thankful for that. <laughs> but in there it has one word. He went forward alone. Now, if I'd been writing that citation, I would have never put that in there because I truly was never alone. I had Marines around me that were just as concerned about my life as I was about their life. And I have said since day two, day one I was so scared I couldn't even talk, but day two I did get my voice back. And I've said since day two that that medal that I wear does not belong to me. It belongs specifically to two of those four Marines who gave their lives protecting mine. So when I wear the medal, I never wear it for what I did. I was only doing a job for which the Marine Corps had trained me to do. They did more than that. They gave their lives. So I can never repay what I owe. It's hard to keep up with him. 
<laughs> I think the question was more about how your upbringing prepared you for uh, military service. And I'm not sure that uh, you can ever be prepared for military service. I mean, you knew generally what it was like to serve in the military, but you had no idea what you were going to be getting into when you were part of the military. Um, I had discipline in my family, too. We grew up much like Woody's did from the World War II time frame. And at that time, there was uh, you learned to be respectful. You learned to be uh, disciplined and do what you were told. And you had your jo jobs and duties to do. And you did them, like Woody said, to the best of your ability. Um, but uh, I, I don't know if any of that you know, prepared me for, for uh, the exposure I had when I went into the military. Um, I think later we're going to be talking about uh, combat training, but when I first went into the military, um, I, I, like I said, I went into, to, uh, into the flight program, and for those of you that, that go into that, um, uh, you're a new kid on the block, and you come into an uh, indoctrination program, and all of a sudden you're, <laughs> guess who runs that program is Marines. That's a why. That's an eye opener right there. That introduces you to the military. But um, I, I didn't ever had problems with the discipline portion of it either, uh, and I think mostly because of the way I grew up. But uh, as far as as being trained uh, ahead of time to serve in the military, um, I didn't have any exposure to that really, other than the stories that I would hear my, when my father would would uh, speak. Of, of his service, which he didn't do very often. Most of the people from that era didn't talk much about what their service was. They served, they came back, they lived their lives, and that was it. So, uh, I, you know, I was kind of unprepared for what I was going to experience when I went into the military. So um, it, it was a whole new exposure for me. Uh, but um, I was, like, like, uh, like Woody said, um, I was very proud to serve this country, and uh, I, I can't I can't thank enough the experiences that I had uh, in the military and what they did for me in my later life. Um, and uh, I, I'm I'm extremely grateful that I had that opportunity and served with the with the people that I served with because uh, each and every one of them um, we all looked out for each other. You can't, when you get in combat, um, the people around you uh, become closer to you and your family. And uh, it's an incredible uh, brotherhood that you are part of and join. And uh, it, it, it is something that uh, is rarely experienced elsewhere. So, uh, but as far as being prepared for it for I, before I went into it, I, I really wasn't. I just kind of went into it um, uh, blind and, and made the best of it I could, as I could. So. Um, kind of growing up for me, like I said, I, I did have a lot of tradition of service in my, my family. Um, and I, I really reflect back to my grandfather who taught me so many great life lessons. Um, you know, he'd always taught me, when you tell someone you're going to do something, you do it. Uh, don't say a whole lot, because when you finally do talk, people will listen. And I think it was that kind of environment of establishing values and not priorities, because uh, values are always constant and priorities can always change, uh, kind of helped me along the way. Um, I graduated high school when I was still 17. And like I said, I didn't really want to stick around that summer and continue to milk cows. Uh, so I told my dad I was going to join the Army. And he had told me right off the bat, uh, if you're going to do it, at least pick a job that's not combo at, combat MOS, uh, be an x-ray tech or something. Um, and I said, all right, well, I'll think about it. Um, and I went down to the recruiter, talked to him, came back, and I told my dad, well, I wanted to join uh, the armor branch beyond tanks. And dad looked at me and he said, well, you're 17 right now. Um, might not be today, 
might not be in 20 years, but right now the nation's kind of at peace. I will not sign for you to go at 17 because your nation, one of these days, can call upon you to go and do things you'll never forget. That'll stick with you the rest of your life. And before you make that commitment, make sure you understand this. And when you turn 18 and you're old enough to be legal in the eyes of, of the law, you can make that decision on your own. And as soon as I turned 18, the next day I signed up. Uh, shipped off shortly there afterwards. But I'd always kept that in the back of my mind. Because like I said, when I, when I did join in 99, you know, Kosovo was the big deployment. Uh, the war on terror wasn't even really thought of in the, the mainstream eyes. Um, and I carried that with me a long ways through the service. Nothing will prepare you for what you're gonna truly experience when it comes to your first time in, in basic or boot camp. Um, or the first time you do ship to a foreign land that you've never heard of on the map. Um, but to have those values established, to have that, that base, that foundation that, that starts off for everything else is, is what I felt really gave me a uh, competitive advantage uh, going forward in life. Thank you, gentlemen. I mean, you help us see through a window that many of us can relate to, which is life prior to the Army or Navy or Marine Corps. Uh, you've helped us see through a window, again, that, that many of us in here can kind of see through, which is uh, preparation once you've gotten into the service. Um, I'd ask now that you help us understand that we're not going to see through this window, obviously, um, but help us understand what you were thinking about in combat, perhaps specifically in the events surrounding the uh, citation that was read, um, or anything in combat generally, uh, to understand the process, the, the mindset required in extremist situations, such as the three, obviously, that you were involved in. Leadership is a difficult thing to really define. And I, in my own case, I, I have to go back to my childhood that when I was told I had to do something, then I couldn't depend on somebody else to do it. It was up to me. And if I didn't do it correctly, and to the satisfaction of the, the brother that was supervising the farm, I was in trouble. So I learned early in life, do what you're supposed to do and do it the very best that you could. When I got into the Marine Corps, they emphasized very strongly, at least in my boot camp, that you never know when you may have to take over a situation. And whether you have two stripes on your sleeve or captain bars on your shoulder, when those circumstances occur, you have got to step into the breach. It's, they're going to depend upon you. The day that my commanding officer, Captain Beck, asked me if I could do anything about the pillboxes that had us stalled. We had lost most of our Marines in my company. We had lost all but two of our officers. We had sergeants op operating as squad leaders and platoon sergeants and corporals acting as squad leaders and section leaders because at that moment in time somebody had to step in the breach and do something and that day when we were gathered in that great big shell crater at a NCO meeting I'm a corporal I'm not supposed to be at an NCO meeting corporals are just a little less than a private. 
But I wasn't supposed to be there. I was not classified as an NCO officer. But I was told I would be there because I had a unit. When I hit the beach at Iwo Jima, I had six Marines that were under my control. They were flamethrower demolition operators. Uh, we were trained both to blow it up or burn it up. I had lost those six individuals, either wound or killed. So now I am it. I'm the only flamethrower demolition operator in my company. And when he asked me that day, could I do something about those pillboxes that had us stopped? I had to step into a leadership position. And I have no idea what I said. Others said later after the campaign was over and we got back to Guam. Somebody said my response to the captain was, I'll try. I don't know what I said. But when he assigned those four Marines to me that was read in the citation, they became my responsibility. And had I backed off, had I not followed through with whatever little bit of leadership I had, you would have never heard of Woody Williams. So whether it is ingrained in us or whether we're trained for it, I do not know. I can't define that. But I think every one of us have within us at a moment in time when it's very important that we do something for somebody else, 99.9% .9 of us will do it. If that's leadership, then thank God. Question of leadership is uh, is you know, can be can be defined in many many ways. Um, uh, if, if you take it down to minute actions or to events that you were involved in, um, you, know, you make decisions based on uh, information you have coming into you, and you evaluate that, and hopefully you have enough good judgment and common sense to make the correct. Uh, decision on, on how to handle the situation that you're that you're faced with um, in combat um, some of those decisions are made instantaneously and they need to be uh, you're trained you go through uh, an enormous amount of training before you ever deploy uh, your people that are with you particularly in my situation I have a, I had a extremely well trained uh, unit that I was part of uh, all of them very, very capable people. All of them could be leaders. Um, they were just exceptional uh, units when I, uh, or individuals when I deployed. Um, and I had been in many, many uh, battles and in, in, in conflicts um, uh, during my tours overseas. When this particular mission happened, um, I didn't get selected for this mission because I was anybody special. I didn't say, geez, this is the guy, the only guy that can do it. Um, but in essence, I, I was the only guy left. Uh, we're, this was at the time frame that uh, the North Vietnamese were overrunning uh, the South Vietnamese uh, um, country. It's called Easter Offensive. And the only thing that we had to combat them was, was air power. Uh, and as a result of that, uh, Electronic commerce plane got shot down. Uh, the, of the six-man crew, there was only one survivor. And over the course of eight days, uh, both the Army and Air Force tried to extract those people. It cost them 14 lives, two people captured, lost eight aircraft. And uh, um, they got to a position where they couldn't uh, continue that, that rescue mission. Um, and uh, ground effort was uh, suggested and um, at the time the units that were going to run that, I mean I was the only only um, SEAL advisor that was still 
in country and could run the mission. Um, uh, you don't really even know what you're walking into. All you knew, all I knew was that we had three pilots that were on the ground needed to be rescued. And we have an oncoming North Vietnamese offensive push into South Vietnam. Had no idea how many were there. Found out later that because of an action of a young Marine, a uh, fellow by the name of Ripley, uh, who blew up a bridge, which was one of the few bridges that the armored units could use to cross the uh, Quang Viet River, uh, Nieu Gang River actually, uh, he destroyed it. Um, that left one other bridge available, which was where all these pilots were, were shot down. Um, and uh, that put all those North Vietnamese forces right in the middle of where I was going. I didn't know it at the time. I later found out there was over 30,000 North Vietnamese there. I knew there was a bundle because I moved to them every night. Um, but my uh, actions were um, to me, it was what I, the job I do, uh, and I knew that those people would not get out if I didn't perform my job the way I'm supposed to and, and, and get them out of there because there was no other way to do that. Uh, and that, that's what drives you to perform your operations. Um, heroism is kind of a strange um, word. Uh, I don't, none of us here believe we were heroes. None of us here believe that we did anything extraordinary. We did what we, what we you know, been trained to do. Um, we certainly don't wear the medal for ourselves. We work for those who can't, uh, for all those that served, and for those that gave their life in that service. Um, but you're, you know, you're not, you don't ever consider yourself a hero. You, you were successful in a, in a certain mission, and um, somewhere later down the chain, somebody thinks, Jesus, you know, we got to reward this guy for it. You don't go after that award. It's like Purple Heart, you don't want it. Uh, sometimes you get it whether you want it or not, but uh, um, uh, it just happens. You do what you've been trained to do, and, uh, and thankfully, I was successful enough to be able to, to rescue those folks, but, um, you know, it's, it's not something that you can, you can train for, prepare for. You do your job the best you can, and uh, um, that's all most of us do when we serve. We do the best job we can, and uh, that's pretty much what happened in my, in my situation. <laughs> Tommy, Tommy said it quite well there that, I mean, there's no real training that will prepare you exactly for one particular scenario. Um, the training you receive, though, does give you that good foundation and, and baseline to build off from. Uh, the, the thing I've always noticed, though, was the, the best experience or the best training was experience um, and relying on that, uh, relying on the guys around you that have been there and done that before. Uh, for us, that day before going over to Afghanistan, Sergeant Kirk was one of my team leaders. Sergeant Kirk was just in that same area less than eight months beforehand. Um, and you can watch all the PowerPoint presentations you want, get all the S2 briefs you want. They don't give it any justice until you get boots on the ground and see it firsthand. Well, we had Sergeant Kirk that was there for that. And we adjusted some of our training um, to counter that, teaching guys how to do angle fire, you know, shooting straight up and down mountains. Um, but that day, you know, the thought process, uh, I don't know if I'm slow or not, but I don't remember thinking a whole lot that day. I, it was a 13-hour firefight, and I don't remember very many times actually thinking more than I was feeling, feeling the need to do my job because I knew my battle buddies around me were doing theirs, feeling the need to, to continue to push no matter what the odds were, uh, feeling the need to, you know, and. And I hope you guys can agree with me. And as you hear these citations, it's the medal isn't given out off of body count. It's not a status of who killed more that day or who didn't. If you look at every one of these citations, we were doing it to save a life, to protect our brothers, 
to do it because we didn't hate the enemy in front of us. We did it because we loved the men to our left and right and our families that support behind us. That's what motivated, that's the, the overall trend of that loyalty will get you so far. That duty will get your guys to accomplish a mission, but loyalty will get them to follow you anywhere. Um, that day when I, I walked into the barracks to ask for that group of volunteers uh, in the midst of getting overran to come up with a harebrained idea of let's counterattack. Well, who counterattacks when you're getting overran? And five guys without hesitation, Raz, Delaney, Danley, Miller, and Jones stood up. I wouldn't have done it. I, at least I, I can't imagine if someone ran into a barracks like that and asked for volunteers that I would go. But these five guys, no hesitation, said we'll follow you anywhere because we knew we had guys that were stranded, that were overran and isolated. That if we were out there, Gallegos and Kirk and the rest of them would have came and got us. And it was the least we could do to repay them back. Just that loyalty to each other, that not doing anything more than any other soldier would have done that day. Um, to understand that to save a life, the, the love for your fellow man is way more powerful and way more motivating than the hate toward an enemy. Well, gentlemen, uh, before we throw this open to the uh, audience for questions, I've got one more thing uh, that I'd like to ask of you. In fact, as you look around, there's a lot of young people in the audience, uh, from high school level, certainly a lot of midshipmen. Uh, have joined us today. If you could share uh, something to build on, some of the nuggets that you've already shared with us, uh, to help them prepare for the service ahead of them, the sacrifices that they'll make uh, in their careers, of whatever stripe they happen to be, uh, what would be that nugget you would share with the next generation? I guess I would go back to my school teacher. Pay attention. I have said many times, I don't think I've ever had an original thought in my life. But I did this morning. There is a miracle still happening in the world. I came up with an original thought. We even Googled it. And we can't find anybody who has had this same original thought. So I think I'm safe. If Google doesn't have it, it doesn't exist. Do the vice, pay the price. Do the vice, and pay the price. I guess my my advice would be basically pick a good role model. Somebody that has been successful in their life. You don't want to be like them, I don't mean that. But that individual had something that you could build on and some basis in which you can pattern your life. We have a 400-bed prison within four miles of my house. There are 650 people in the 400-bed prison. And as I talk to youth around over the country, do not pattern your life after a failure. If you do, you are going to fail. And those individuals do not make good role models. So don't follow their pattern. Follow that individual who has been successful because they have characteristics, they have integri integrity, they have a basis, a ground from which they build, and you can build on that very same 
ground. So I say again, pay attention. Kind of an interesting question. A nugget of information that would help them <laughs> be, uh, be successful in your careers. Um, I don't think there's any one uh, nugget you can you can throw out there. Um, you know, I think probably uh, the thing that, that that always helped me was I always strove strove to do the best job that I possibly could. Um, I did listen. I did pay attention. Sometimes I ignored it, but um, I, uh, I evaluated and I made decisions um, which I thought were, were uh, would help me and, or help, help the group I was with to do, perform the job uh, successfully. I remember when I was in school, um, in high school, we had a, there was a coach that we had, it wasn't mine, but he had made some, he was a great basketball coach, as a matter of fact, John Wooden. And Wooden had a couple of sayings that were very, uh, uh, impressed me by quite a bit. Um, one was, um, be more respectful of your character than your reputation. Because your character is who you really are. Uh, your reputation is what people think you are. And that's kind of stuck with me. Um, and the other thing he had was, Winning the game is a result of the rest of the team, not an individual. And that is so true. Uh, to be sure that your your team is, uh, you're not going to do things by yourself. You're going to need it, uh, people to assist you and help you. And when you're in combat, it's the guy beside you on either side. Um, and you depend on them to do their job. And, uh, if they believe in the same uh, desire to perform the best they can, you're going to come out of you're going to come out ahead. Uh, and I always tried to use those guidelines when I was uh, going through some of the trials that, uh, that you go through in life, and they all served me successfully. And I think probably those are what I would uh, try to impart upon you. But I tell you, I uh, I can't thank. You. Uh, the military enough for allowing me to serve for it because it was an incredible opportunity for me uh, to gain um, the wisdom and the experiences that later helped me live through the, the rest of my life. And uh, um, to all of you that are, you know, now in the service or, or uh, uh, just starting out, um, it's a great career. Enjoy it and uh, make the best of it. And thank God we're in, we're, we have people today that, that uh, in this country that volunteer to, uh, to serve and to keep us free. And my hat's off to you and thank you so much for that. Um, kind of my experience uh, with some of the, the best officers I ever had as an NCO were the officers that came into the platoon and would straight admit, I don't know what the hell I'm doing, and would listen to the experience of the guys around them. Um, for the midshipmen that will be out in our, our fleets pretty soon, you know, I'm not a fortune teller by no means, but it does look like we are starting to draw down some of our combat experience. And that experience is going to get hard to come by very quickly. And let's not waste the opportunity or pass up the opportunity to pick those guys' brains before they're, they're gone. They're no longer available to do that. Um, like I said, I always thought experience was one of the best tools ever. Because uh, you never know what you're going to experience in life until you experience. You never know, you're never going to know how you're going to react to it until it does happen. Um, it's as simple as that. Um, and to understand that, you know, don't just make yourself better, but make those around you better. You can be the best at everything you do, but if you're around people that are struggling and you do nothing to assist them, the team is weak overall. And a very strong team will beat 
an individual any day of the week, hands down. Um, it's a proven fact time and time again. That's really, really true. Uh, and that's the, the things I would just like to, to pass on. It's something as simple as that. You know, as, as a young recruit at, uh, at Paris Island, I had a battalion commander, himself also a, a Medal of Honor recipient named James Livingston, who was very fond of saying that honor and bravery are passed from one generation to another. Uh, and I don't think that I'd ever actually seen it on display or could have imagined it on display quite this way, whether that be 1945, 1972, 2009. Uh, we get this feeling of, of the theme that carries down through the decades. And uh, I just want to also, uh, once again, emphasize how unique uh, an experience this is and how privileged I personally feel. I think we all are uh, for all of that. So with that in mind, I'd like to uh, open it up to questions. We have microphones and uh, some folks delivering microphones. So right here's one. Midshipman? There's, there's a mic, if you don't mind, please. <laughs> Test. Staff, Staff Sergeant, Sergeant Midshipman Four Class Ma, how did you deal with the friction between your father prior to joining the military? Um, I mean, there, there really wasn't friction there, more than just a, more of a concern of, you know, he'd been there, he'd been through combat, and it's something you don't understand until you're there, and that was him being a father. Um, I, I can't thank him enough for giving me that advice. I wouldn't change a damn thing, hands down, I wouldn't, but to understand that he cared enough about me to pass on that from his generation to mine, and I will continue to pass on that to my children. If any one of them come and ask me, you know, Dad, I'm going to serve, I'm going to tell them the same thing. You're going to be asked to go and do things you'll never forget, um, and you don't have to do it. We are a volunteer army, and less than half a percent of this nation serves right now, and it's a beautiful thing to watch that, but I, I, I'm hoping I can instill the values that my family did in me and to my children, because one day at combat, isn't defining my life. My life will be defined when my children grow up and they're successful and they continue on. Thank you, Staff Sergeant. Down here. Okay, great. We'll get to you next. Uh, gentlemen, I'm in awe of your actions and uh, I'm just so curious how you managed to overcome the, uh, the fear and feeling of self-preservation that I know most of us would feel in the circumstances you experienced. Great question. Who would like to take that one? First firefight does that. <laughs> 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 you get, uh, yeah, yeah. You, you train and you train and you train and, you, and you're uh, exceptionally well trained uh, by the time you go into combat. Um, but like Clint just said, you, you're, you can't explain what combat's like till you've been in one. Um, you don't have time to be fearful. Uh, you have too much time, you, you're too busy trying to, trying to uh, stay alive and keep your people alive that you, uh, fear is not a factor until maybe you get back afterwards and have a beer when she flicks we got out of that. Um, you know, it's, it's a, uh, um, you're reacting to a situation and you react the way you've trained. Um, and you're depending on your teammates to, to do the same. And uh, fear doesn't, doesn't enter into it. You don't really uh, have time to be fearful. I mean, there's, there's, uh, um, you have, you're too busy trying, trying to uh, save the situation you're in or, or the people that are around you that need assistance that you know, fear is not a factor. Um, and uh, I've seen fear. I've well, let's put it this way: when I was during that rescue mission, we got mortared and rocketed every day, and there was a 20-man armored, uh, uh, 20-man uh, unit, Vietnamese unit there. There was supposed to be a guard force, but they were under 
orders to leave whenever they felt insecure. And we, the first day we I brought the first pilot back, we got mortared in rocket. I lost half of them, and they just froze. I mean, they didn't. They could not. They could not perform. They were seeing their buddies blown away, and they could not function. So, um, myself and my the other Vietnamese officer that was with me, we just went around and started throwing, trying to trying to get them uh, up and return fire, get them uh, return fire from where we were taking uh, the assault from, and then started just bringing, getting bodies and, and triaging people and just throwing them in cover and trying to get these guys thinking, we got to fight. Um, my guys were ready to do that because we'd been trained to do it, but uh, I, I've seen it. But it never happened with the units I was part of because you don't have time to think about that. You have time to think about, react to the situation, and uh, um, that's what you do. So I hope that answers your question. Got any further thoughts? Could I add to that? Sure. Why, do, why don't we use 65-year-old men to fight wars? Good idea. <laughs> <laughs> if we did, we probably would never win one. <laughs> At 21 years of age, you're invincible, number one. Number two, you have been trained to perform. And automation, we had automation in World War II, not quite as much as we have today, but we had automation because automatically your training took over. And I attribute my accomplishment totally to my training. If I had stopped and thought, hey, if I try to knock out that pillbox, those people might kill me. I wouldn't have gone. I said, heck, let somebody else go do that. You know. <laughs> so my training took over, automation took over, and I began doing that for which I had been trained. So that, that is my answer to winning, and it's got to be done by young people. Once we reach a certain age, our caution, our preservation takes over and we began to rationalize. Hey, I'm not going to do that. I wouldn't do today what I did then, I'll guarantee you. <laughs> <laughs> you know, just to, to add a little more to that, it's, you know, it's like anything you do in life. The, the second you think, I can't do that, I'm going to fail, I'm going to lose, if that thought enters your mind before you even start the mission or take on the task, you've already lost right That's there. Right. You can't have doubt in your heart. You can't have, you know, fear in your mind. You know, it's not healthy. It's not helping. So why, why even put that negative thought there? A, we are the greatest fighting force in the world. We are the, the, the movers and doers. There's no obstacle that's going to get in our way. Or we're always going to win. We're always going to overcome the, the greatest of odds. And you've got to have that first and foremost in your mind whenever you, you, you tackle on any task. Commander. Good morning. Um, just listening, I took a few notes so I don't completely mess up my question, but just listening to you all, um, whether you're wearing the medals around your neck or not, you represent what's the best in America. And it's been an absolute honor to listen to you, so thank you. Some of the things that I was hearing from all of you, you learned your patriotism from your teachers, too. You said that. Values over priorities. Um, if you look in the media today, I guess I'm looking more towards the future. The, the opening uh, speaker said, if we don't learn our history, we're doomed to repeat it. And if you look in the, mil in the media these days, you're seeing that the American flag is not allowed to be shown, apartment complexes at schools, the Pledge of Allegiance, people are fighting saying that, the under God. Um, there are high school students in Colorado that are actually walking out of class protesting a patriotic history curriculum. So I guess learning from your history and, and your experience, where do you see America 
going? Do you think we're losing the values that have made us great? Do you think that we're in danger to call our enemy who they are and to take the fight to them? And, and if you do see us going there, how do we get that back? Great question. Oh, that's a good one. Yeah. Um, you know, you always see a cycle in democracy of tyranny followed by revolution, followed by prosperity, followed by overabundance, and back into tyranny. Um, in my opinion, I think we're on the verge of overabundance right now. We've had life too easy for too long, and we've gotten a comfort zone, and we're, as a country, we've forgotten our values uh, greatly. We're teaching priorities to kids. We're teaching that there are no winners and losers. Everyone gets a damn trophy. But I'll tell you what, life isn't fair. There are winners and losers. You can have the best of everything in life and bad crap will still happen. And we need to make sure we continue to teach this lesson to our youth because our youth is gonna carry this message forward. They're gonna continue with it and carry it on. And it starts in our families to teach our children. Don't rely on your, your teachers at school. It's not, I mean, yeah, you send your kids off to school for 18 years of their life or however long you go to school. I barely graduated, so I forgot. Um, but you know, it, it needs to be us as an individual, as a family unit, unit to bring that values back to our children and to continue to push that. Because it's by the education of our youth to never forget the sacrifice of what was given beforehand for the benefits we reap now that like I said, are just getting, getting forgotten. That there's not enough skin in the game, it seems, that everyone forgets. Just not too many years ago, the sacrifices at Iwo Jima guys in Vietnam you know this is paid in blood sweat and tears this America we live in today and we can never forget that and we must we must teach our children that I agree I, uh... I think a lot of it comes to teaching our, our kids today uh, parents to be teaching their kids um, the, what this country has gone through to be the, the country that we are. Uh, and yes, you do see examples of uh, uh, what seems to be um, unpatriotic uh, activities. Yeah. And unfortunately, they get the news media. Um, I don't know that our, full, our whole country is like that. Where I live, I don't see much of that at all. Um, and we still have, thankfully, people that, uh, that volunteer to fight for our country. The sad thing is the small number that do. Clint referred to it as like 1% of our country volunteers to, to serve for it. Uh, that's sad. That is really sad. Uh, but why is that? Is it that we, we, we do live too well, that we don't experience um, or, or see what it's like uh, not to have the things that we, that we enjoy? And another statement that Clint made was when he was overseas, the first time he'd been to a third world country, what it was like to live in a third world country. I, every American ought to see what it's like to live in a third world country, to realize the benefits and uh, the uh, the freedoms that we enjoy, um, but we get more moved away from that. And uh, sometimes I think we think uh, it can't happen to us, and that's not what reality is. It can happen to us, and uh, we need to re-educate uh, the, the, our future uh, kids, uh, kids, you know, men and women. Um, in that mindset, but it needs to come, it's not only gonna come from, from their friends and their classmates, but from their parents. And if their parents don't believe it and try and instill that in their kids, uh, who's going to? Uh, and I think that's probably where, where, our, where it needs to start. Um, and I, I, yeah. thankfully there are those that, that, that uh, already are, are on board and, and, uh, and, and volunteer to, uh, to serve and to um, sacrifice. But it should be this whole country that does. And, and uh, um, I think that's where 
we need to start is in the homes. Well, let me say, I don't have a high IQ. In fact, I'm not even sure I can find it. But I do feel, maybe this is egotistical, that God blessed me with a little bit of common sense, which I think we have lost in this country. We have lost our common sense. I believe we become what we're taught. The principal difference between the Japanese and the American in the Pacific, I can't speak for Germany because I was not over there, but the principal difference between the Japanese and the Americans in the Pacific was, our belief was, we want to survive and we're going to do whatever we possibly can do in order to preserve that life. Their belief was, it was an honor to die for the emperor, which made us total conflict. And even though we would try to preserve them, to treat them, to save them, that isn't what they wanted. Because to save them and become a prisoner of war was one of the most disgraceful things that could happen to them. That was their culture. That's what they were taught. And if we in this country do not get back to the basics and teach what our nation has stood for all of these many years, and that there are values that you never forsake, you never give up. Unless we get back there, I do have fear. It won't come in my time. I've maybe got 10 more years. I'm, I'm trying to reach Methuselah, but I don't think I'm gonna make it. <laughs> but in a few years, we will lose our very basic values of love for one another, helping one another, and surviving. I believe that. I think we have time for one more, and Midshipman, you've got the, the honor of the last question. Gentlemen, Shima Third Class Young, what were your perspectives like immediately following the Medal of Honor experiences? Did you stay in your service? And why and how did you eventually choose to leave your service? I can do that one. That's easy for me. Um, I, I was already retired. Um, I was wounded fairly severely about six months after the operation I ran in uh, on an operation up in the North Vietnam. And, um, uh, shot up uh, covering my guys on a retreat. We were in a firefight with 150 North Vietnamese, and I had five guys. Um, the others, I had another SEAL with me who rescued me. He received the Medal of Honor for that action. Um, but uh, um, I'm a nice guy. Everywhere I went, they shot at me. I don't understand that. But <laughs> at any rate, the Navy retired me as a result of those injuries. Thank goodness we now evaluate uh, people that have been injured and wounded and then um, uh, give them the opportunity to stay in if they want to. But um, so I was retired when uh, I received my award. Uh, if the, the question of how it, how it affected me after that, is, is, was that part of your question? Um, you know, <laughs> wearing this medal is, uh, I think more difficult than it certainly was to receive it, um, or to, to earn it. Uh, you do your job to earn it, but uh, wearing it is um, is tougher. People put you on a pedestal. People think that you're somebody special, um, and you don't feel that way at all. It's you're you're humbled. You're um, uh, you're. You don't feel that that uh, that that you should be 
be placed in that position. Um, but it, it's a, it's, uh, you're very proud to have been presented it. Um, it certainly opens a lot of doors that you otherwise would never have had open to you. Uh, I certainly wouldn't be sitting in front of you if I didn't have it. Um, and it, it opens a lot of opportunities, but you have to utilize those and remember uh, that you're a representative of, of uh, excuse me, of this country and, and those in uniform that have served for this country. And what you do and the choices you make uh, reflect upon that because people look at you as an example. So um, you need to be very careful about the actions you take and what you do. Uh, but um, so it was, it was, uh, it's both a, a wonderful benefit to be able to be able to wear that honor, but it also has a lot of responsibility that goes with it. And it, it's uh, something that you need to always remember that uh, uh, this medal doesn't represent you. It represents all those that, uh, that served and, and gave their lives in, in, in serving this country. So it's quite a responsibility to carry, believe me. Um, but uh, it's quite, it, it's an honor. Uh, and and um, you're, uh, uh, as much as it, it um, sometimes becomes a, a burden, it, uh, it's also a responsibility. And uh, you only hope that you can, you can carry it with honor and with, uh, with dignity. I'm going to be last. Oh, why do you get to be last? Because <laughs> I'm older Because he's the old man. <laughs> You're not 35 anymore? <laughs> um, for me, actually, I was going to get out of the military after, or before I even went on my last deployment to Afghanistan. I'd, me and my wife had decided, uh, had done enough. It was time to grow up and figure out what I was really going to do with my life. So the decision was already made before even going overseas. Um, and immediately, you know, after that day, the, the thoughts were never, um, you know, I, I did something to receive something. Um, my big thing was making sure the guys that were there with me got acknowledged. And more importantly, you know, I was proud uh, of that moment of walking into the barracks and having five guys volunteer to, 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 to go on a counterattack. Well, I was so impressed with the true grit and just the willingness to continue on because we had nine more months left in country after that day. It wasn't you got done with one day and you get a free ride back to the States. You know, we had to pick up the pieces and to watch my platoon reconstitute after so much loss and to re, you know, incorporate the replacement guys um, to take them under, the, under their wings and, and bring them into the fold just like they were uh, Kirk and Gallegos and Mace and, and uh, Hart. You know, take them and have them step right into their shoes and, and finish the mission. Um, and when I got out in early 2011, I had no idea. It wasn't until almost a year later that I'd gotten a call um, from a colonel out of the from a colonel out of the Pentagon asking if I'd come back to D.C. for something he couldn't tell me over the phone which I replied to, I don't have enough vacation days, I'm not going anywhere. <laughs> and what did I do wrong? <laughs> um, so being finally brought out to, uh, to understand uh, what my actions were, were getting recognized with. Um, and like Tommy said, though, it's, it is a responsibility to wear this little blue ribbon of silk around your neck. Um, just the caretaker of it. This represents every man and woman, every Marine, Airman, Sailor, Coast Guard, 
Air Force, uh, every aspect of our military, past, present, and future. This is their award. We're just selected to wear it. And every time I put it on, I think about the eight guys we lost that day. What would they think of me with this decision I'm about to make? Would they appreciate it? Or would they turn and discuss? And that's how I continue on and continue forward. Well, the Medal of Honor certainly changed my life. Uh, when I got home and they started giving me $10 a month for it, I thought, boy, I'm rich. <laughs> I was a country boy that was very shy and bashful. You don't believe that, do you? <laughs> but I was. But probably the best thing that happened to me was receiving the Medal of Honor. I'm talking about psychologically. We didn't have PTSD in World War II. We had psychoneuroses. So if you were diagnosed with psychoneuroses, you were a psycho. And nobody wanted that connotation associated with them. I had a brother in the bulge that cracked up, we called it, in the Marine Corps. And that was the diagnosis. And when he came home, he would not permit to file a claim with the VA for psychoneuroses because that would mean he was a psycho. When I received the Medal of Honor, I had no choice. From the second day on, I became a public figure. I didn't want to be that. I wanted to go back to the farm and dig a hole and get in it. Because I had a lot of whatever they term now PTSD, but in those days, it, as I said, it was psychoneuroses. And we had no treatment facilities. We had no psychiatrists. We had no psychologists. We had no VA, no VA facility that we could even go to. And being forced by the public to talk about what happened to me was the best therapy I could have received. Because I couldn't pin it up, I couldn't hold it in, I had to let it go. And that helped me tremendously to adjust back to civil life. You guys, all of you in the military, know that when you grow up and your folks are teaching you things you ought to know, one of those things they teach you very firmly is you do not kill, period. There is no exception. And then you go into a combat situation where you have to reverse that completely. If you're going to survive, now you must do that which you have never been permitted to do and taught not to do. In our case in World War II, I was in for the duration. And when the war was over, they handed me a discharge and said, we're done with you. You've done well but just go home and 24 hours, revert to where you were three years ago. Almost an impossibility because the brain doesn't stop working. It keeps going. We have a similar problem here today with individuals who have the PTSD. 
unfortunately, our facilities, our treatment methods, our knowledge and information about it is so much greater and more accessible than it's ever been in the history of this country. And we all can be very proud of that. I am. I was a veterans counselor for 33 years, and in our early part, we had no answers. We had nobody to go to, nobody to talk to except each other. <clears throat> I'm grateful that somebody had the wisdom and the foresight to establish the situation that we have today because it is so much more beneficial to those coming home than we've ever had. I'm grateful to my nation. Well, gentlemen, I just want to extend thanks once again. You've given us a tremendous education this morning, a, a tremendous perspective. Uh, this is a rare, in fact, a completely unique opportunity uh, to hear the perspective across generations like this. And, and I can't uh, say how privileged I feel, and, and I know we all feel for, for this opportunity. So with that said, uh, Captain Huey, would you like to bring us home? <coughs> So it is with great regret that I have to bring this panel to a close. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, please join me in thanking our distinguished panelists for their extraordinary service at the moment of crisis and for their extraordinary humanity ever since. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you very much.